Uh, my name is David Brownell. I'm the executive director of the North Olympic History Center. Uh, as always, the North Olympic History Center acknowledges that we do our work on the lands of the first peoples of this area, the Sklalem, Macaw, Quileute, and Ho River tribes. We recognize the rich and important history of the tribal nations in Colum County and commit our work to this land acknowledgement to work together collectively to help preserve and share their histories. Um, as always, this presentation will be recorded and posted on the Jamestown Tribal Library's YouTube page, uh, which you can find at youtube.com slash JST library. Um, today, we're joined by archaeologist Gary Wesson. Uh, Gary holds an MA and a PhD in anthropology from Washington State University and has operated as an archaeological archaeological consultant in the Northwest since 1983. Uh, he has 50 years of archaeological fieldwork experience in Western North America, with the vast majority of his experience being in lowland and coastal forest settings here in Western Washington. Uh, to date, he's worked with or conducted 10 large-scale excavation projects, 93 small-scale site testing and evaluation projects, and more than 500 archaeological site survey reports. He has identified and recorded approximately 370 previously unknown prehistoric archaeological sites uh, and uh, updated documentation on approximately 600 prehistoric archaeological sites. Uh, so without further ado, it's my pleasure to welcome uh, Gary today to talk to us about some archaeological intrigues and enigmas. Thanks for joining us, Gary. Okay, uh, yeah, thank you everybody. Um, when uh, Dave told me a little bit about the Learning Our Landscape series and invited me to tell a story or two, uh, I thought about it for a bit and uh, two things I've done in Clallam County came quickly to mind. And uh, let me say, first off, uh, I didn't suggest a title at the time. Um, and so archaeological enigmas and intrigues is uh, something that David provided. Um, I'll certainly agree with the enigmas part. I'm not sure about the intrigues. And actually, uh, I'm going to talk about two features and that I've had work and uh, work association with uh, over the years. And to my mind, I want to give you some sense of where they are in the landscape. Uh, you can actually view both of them. And normally, I don't tell people precisely where archaeological features are, but I'm going to tell you where precisely where both of these are. Uh, one of them, uh, I think it's pretty clear what it actually is, but it took a little while to figure it out. And uh, the other one is admittedly, as you'll see, a bit more problematic as to what it actually is. Uh, in fact, I received a paper from a geologist just this morning after seeing the notice about the second place I'm going to talk about. So. Uh, People have a bunch of ideas. Okay, just to get started, uh, the uh, two locations I want to talk about today, uh, I'm going to call uh, calling one the Kitchen Dick Road feature, and it's up here uh, near Dungeness Pit in the northeastern part of the county. Uh, and the other one I'm going to call the West Twin Creek feature, and it's actually in the intertidal areas. Uh, just a little bit west of Twin Creek, and uh, we'll talk about more of them uh, in detail. But but for but let me point out just for starting, if if you're interested by any of this, uh, the Kitchen Dick Road feature is actually on private property, but it's easily viewable from Kitchen Dick Road, and the West Twin Creek feature is actually on the beach in the tidal area on public lands. So uh, both of these places are things you can go see. And frankly, I'm in part hoping that maybe somebody listening to this can tell me a little bit more about either of these places uh, at, after I tell you what I know. Okay, let's talk about the Kitchen Dick Road feature first. Uh, and here's a map of the Eastern County County. This is, uh, this is Kitchen Dick Road here, it makes the hard uh, right, right turn to the east on Lots Gazelle Road and the Dungeness Rec areas right here, including Voice of America Park and then Dungeness Spit. And I'm talking about a feature right here. Okay, and uh, just to show you a little bit more on the ground of what we're talking about, this is a relatively recent aerial photograph of the same area. 
Here's Kitchen Dick Road. Here's the turn onto Lotz Gazelle. Uh, Voice of America Park is here. This is the base of Dungeness Spit. And what I'm talking about is this feature right here. There's a long longitudinal scrape in the ground. Give you a little closer view of what, what it looks like. Uh, again, here's Kitchen Dick Road. Uh, just for reference, for those of you who know this area, familiar with it, this is Robeson Road coming across here. And this is Klahani Road. Um, and this is the feature. Uh, Another way or another way of presenting it pretty well is to look at it in a LIDAR image. And if people are not familiar with LIDAR, LIDAR is a laser radar. It's a way of using the principle of radar, but instead of using radio waves, they use a laser beam. And LIDAR imagery is coming into much wider use in the last few decades for mapping on the ground. You can see very high resolution images in it. And the feature I'm talking about is this right here. Oh, excuse me, I want to go back one, back one, I'm finished there. You can see it's cut into the ground on this side of the road, on the west side of the road, and on the north side of the road. It looks like it's been disturbed here, but it's a built up feature creating a level surface completely across. Uh, and I suspect that a lot of this irregular surface that we see in a LiDAR image on one side of it is actually spoil material from the grading. And in fact, here's a picture uh, taken uh, about six or seven years ago off Kitchen Dick Road. This is looking to the south. Here's the Mount Angeles range. And this is the western side of this feature. Uh, this is some of the spoil pile I was referring to. This may also be spoil pile. And you can see the floor of this is, it's, it, it ranges, but it's on the order of two to two and a half feet below the existing grade over this whole area. And uh, I didn't give you the dimensions on the LIDAR thing, but this entire linear feature is approximately 1700 feet long, uh, 260 feet wide. And so it, it occupies a total area of approximately 10 acres. Okay, uh, I was approached by Collin County Public Works in 2013 to survey along the edge of Kitchen Dick Road. And the folks in the Public Works Office pointed this feature out to me in some of the same aerial photographs I've just shown you and said, uh, well, this isn't really entirely in your project area, but it crosses your project area and we'd like you to figure out what it is. Uh, they additionally told me that they had heard from some residents uh, in that area, uh, the Dungeness area of Thalm County, didn't mention any names to me, who suggested that this was a training airstrip uh, created during World War II, uh, where a large number of Navy pilots were being trained at Alt Field on Whidbey Island. And they had outlying fields in a number of places in Western Washington where novice pilots flew out of and, uh, and, and landed at. And he said they didn't have any actual evidence of that, but the story that they had heard was, is this was an old training field from World War II. Okay, one of the first things that I did once got the job was look around at older aerial photographs to just see how old we could see evidence of this feature. And I have to tell you, there's not a lot of aerial photographs of Western Washington and that predate the 1970s or 1960s. In fact, I think the oldest aerial photographs of anywhere in Western Washington date to the 1930s, and there's not much coverage at that time. In any event, this is obviously a large landscape overview. This picture was made in 1974. Um, here's Kitchen Dick Road, there's the Lots Gazelle Corner, and there, there is the feature, uh, excuse, uh, in fact, blowing that up a little bit gets a little grainy, but here it is, it's right there. In fact, it looked like some of it might've been in agriculture a little bit at that time, but it's around here. But anyway, it's, it's clearly already there in 1974. So it's gotta be at least 50 years old. Um, 
So the first thing that we did, or well, among the early things that we did in the focus for this is uh, talk to some people who knew a little bit about naval aviation, history of maybe naval aviation in this area, and what's kind of normal. And uh, as I said before, there are a number of outlying fields associated with the uh, alt field naval air station on Whidbey Island that are known of. And in fact, the airstrip at Dungeness uh, at, at Edith Hook in Port Angeles was used as an outlying field. Uh, there's no written documentation that we could come up with that suggested that this location was an outlying field. On top of which, uh, one of the guys I talked to who is an old carrier pilot, uh, assured, pointed out that the orientation of this strip is kind of southwest, northeast. If you think about the pictures I've shown you, uh, and with the prevailing westerly wind coming across along the strait, uh, pilots landing on this strip, it would be a crosswind landing and a crosswind takeoff. And uh, he assured me that they don't do things like that to novice pilots, that uh, that, that made it extremely unlikely that, uh, that this was a training field. He also pointed out that the western end and planes would be taking off to the west on this. Uh, the western end of this strip, as I've described to you already, is about two and a half feet below grade. So there's a big bump at the end of it. And uh, they don't usually do that at the end of airstrips either. So he pretty much rejected the idea that this has anything to do with the naval uh, training facility during World War II. Um, after we did that, and we rejected the idea, we started looking around for other possible explanations of this feature. And uh, our attention quickly turned to the proposed Voice of America uh, radio transmission station that was proposed to be built in this area in the early 1950s. Uh, in fact, that's why Voice of America Park uh, over there by the base of Dungeness Spit is called Voice of America Park. Um, and uh, I should say also, just the beginning that when we did the work in 2013-14 timeframe, um, I had somebody do some research for me. He went to the library in Port Angeles and pulled a number of newspapers and other relevant sources to this story. Um, more recently, for the preparation of this paper, I've had an opportunity to look at the resources that the Historical Society has, and they're significantly better. <laughs> so uh, anybody who's interested in pursuing this more, go to the Historical Society, not the library. Uh, in any event, uh, this is a newspaper uh, from uh, January 10th, 1952. This is the Port Angeles Evening News. And you can see uh, at that time, there are already articles appearing in the paper about this location being considered uh, for a Voice of America transmission station. Uh, and in fact, the uh, Fed's uh, eminent domain purchased about a thousand acres in that area at this time and proposed to build a very large transmission facility uh, at, the, at this location. Uh, it met several of the, the, the landform and power resource uh, characteristics that they thought they wanted, and an effort was made or begun to build the facility there. Uh, I should also tell you, and maybe some of you know a bit about this story already, uh, the area was later found to be unsuitable for technical reasons and abandoned, which is why it never, it was never built. And the whole planning the location, finding it's not feasible and canceling it, got caught up in uh, the Joe McCarthy's uh, Committee on American Activities uh, politics at the federal level in the early 1950s. And McCarthy tried to make a scandal of it. It got very complicated. Uh, and there's a bunch of issues we don't really need to go on here, although it's an interesting story. Uh, and let me say, for those of you who might be interested in more details beyond the historical society's resources, uh, I would recommend the book to you. And uh, oh, the book that you'd be interested in looking at is called The Voice of America and the, Amer and the, Amer and the Domestic Propaganda Battles, 1945 to 1953. It's by a guy by the name of David F. Kluger and was published in 2000. 
the University of Missouri Press, and it has the whole gruesome story in great detail. In any event, the newspapers tipped us off that this activity was occurring and in fact told us that what they wanted to build, to make the largest single feature, was going to be a very large curtain uh, antenna built on high pylons. Port Angeles Evening News, this is the best photograph that uh, the Historical Society has, and it looks like it's been a photocopy of a photocopy of a photocopy. I think you can get the sense that there's a very large tower here, cables going across, and then there's a lot of metal uh, material hanging off the towers. And these are quite tall. Uh, these are almost 300 feet tall. And I believe that the one in uh, Dungeness was gonna be almost 800 feet long, really big structure. Um, in an effort to give you a little better picture, because I know this is not a very good picture. Uh, here's a somewhat better picture of a curtain antenna. This one was actually built in California, near Davis, California, over in the valley at about the same time in the early 1950s. Uh, and this is not exactly like the one in Dungeness, but this was probably quite like what the one in Dungeness would have looked like if it was built. And you can see here's a street light on the roadway next to it and some structures down here. That's a really large, massive structure, um, which was, from my point of view, at least fortunately not ever built. <laughs> Okay, in continuing to read about uh, what happened in Colum County, and actually the researcher working with me at that time actually found it in the Port Angeles Library, what we thought was the smoking gun. And uh, can you guys, I don't know, the chat thing, I don't know if you can see it at the, at the very top of the article, but this article is from uh, 1953. And it says, Dungeness farmers want voice acreage back. Basically, after it became clear that the feds were not going to build this, and build this uh, most of the farmers who had land taken wanted their land back. And that's what this, this article is all about. And in the highlighted portion up here at the very top, which I'm hoping you can read, it's not obstructed, but I'll, I'll, I'll read it to you. Uh, it's a statement from a, a farmer in that area, a gentleman named Cameron, who wanted a bunch of his property back uh, and suggested that most of the land was still intact and undisturbed by the federal activities there, which had not proceeded very far. And quote, he said, only 10 acres of the remaining 260 proposed uh, acres were actually rendered useless for future farming. They constitute the land scraped, cut, and filled for the location of the transmission antennas. So I suggest, and you recall, this is about 10 acres. It's, it's the same size that is that Mr. Cameron describes. Uh, I suggest that, in fact, this is the location where the large curtain antenna for the Voice of America facility was going to be built. It was going to stand right there. Um, and uh, to me, without arguing that this is an important historic resource in and of itself, um, this is the only surviving physical evidence of the presence of the proposed Voice of America transmission facility, <laughs> uh, or at least the antenna. There were going to be other smaller buildings associated with it. But this is this is a relic of 1953. I, I, I feel quite confident that that's what this is. And uh, to be honest, I, I'm not actually a member of Clown County, and I'm not advocating a historic sign right there along Kitchen Dick Road. Uh, but uh, it is the the only surviving largely intact feature uh, of that era and that episode in Qualum County. Okay, 
Uh, let's look at the more problematic one, and that's uh, what I'm calling uh, the West Twin Creek feature. Uh, this is a section out of two USGS maps pinned together, but this is the area just beyond West Twin Creek along Highway 112. Uh, in fact, this is a, a, an artificial landing or mole from what's been described as an old clay mine that was in this area. And what I want to talk to you about now is this area right here, where you can see even on the, the, the 12 and a half minute USGS map, there's an arc of rock or a flat, because this is not over a rock, that's tide flat. But there is this arc here. Um, and that's what we're going to talk about. Okay, and first off, just by way, a little background before we talk about this location, um, I want to talk about intertidal fish traps because intertidal fish traps are features that have been reported in multiple places on the Northwest coast and in multiple places on marine beaches and many other places in the world. And uh, here, here are some of Hillary Stewart's drawings and these up here, I think are good examples of what we're talking about. They all pretty much function the same way. And they are uh, stonewall trap. Well, they can be stonewall, they can be wooden stakes also, but, but a wall is built in the intertidal zone below the high tide line uh, and uh, in the intertidal area. So here's your low tide, here's your high tide. So that they are underwater, completely submerged when the water is tide is high and fish can swim into these areas. And then as the tide retreats, uh, these impoundments keep the fish from coming out. Some of them, depending on the substrate they're on, actually hold water for a while. But they, they impound fish uh, as the tide retreats and they make them easy for folks to get out. And they come in a bunch of different ways. And let me show you just a couple of examples from other places first. This is part of the wall of the Stonewall fish trap. This one is actually in Scotland. And you can see it's, you know, maybe six feet long, six to eight feet wide, lots of cobbles, not real high. Some, they vary a bit. Here's another complex. This is a complex from actually Australia. And uh, the, these walls are somewhat larger. It's hard to tell from this scale, but really what I wanna show you is these can, can, can be multi-celled structures and they can cover really large, large hunks of, real, of ground. And yeah, there's a significant energy investment in producing something like this. Uh, but if it, fun, if it you'd build one in a productive place, you can get a lot of resource out of them. And we think these things ha can have long-term temporal uh, continuity. In fact, just as a more recent example, and this is a wooden stake intertidal fish trap, it's not a stone one. But what I want you to consider here, uh, and particularly from the graphic on the side here, this is up in Comox Harbor on the east side of British Columbia. And the people who mapped and explored this one pulled wooden stakes from different parts of it and ran radiocarbon dates on them. And without getting into the esoteria of how radiocarbon dates work, I'm going to tell you that radiocarbon dates do work. They have some limits and precision issues, but they are good, reliable things. And in this graphic here, you see that there are two different stakes from this fishware. And actually you can see almost multiple rebuild episodes here in the walls. But one of these stakes uh, was, is about a thousand years old and another stake is only about 200 years old. Uh, and that is clear evidence that this is a feature that people have been maintaining uh, over a long period of time, from what we understand about Northwest Coast, traditional Northwest Coast cultures, many economic locations are actually lineal property. They're not owned by a single individual. They're owned by a lineage who maintains them year after year. Uh, and they elaborate on them, make them bigger, move them slightly adjust them. But this is, is a pretty common behavior. Okay, now back to West Twin. And, um, give a little credit to other people along the way. Um, this is a, a Department of Ecology oblique aerial 
it's not directly overhead, it's at an angle. And I don't know if other people use this, the department. Washington State Department of Ecology on their website has a giant catalog of shoreline aerial photographs at these oblique angles. Um, they don't select them for time, they just to run a plane through. And you can access all that stuff for free, for free through the Department of Ecology's website. And after teaching a workshop, uh, actually in Nia Bay, uh, and talking about intertidal fish traps because they are recorded in other places. Actually, there's a couple on the Macaw Reservation, at least one. Anyway, uh, one of their fisheries biologists, Nade Kern, sent me this picture from the Department of Ecology website. And he pointed out this rock wall here. And he said, isn't that a fish trap? And if you're thinking, well, gee, that's Highway 112, there's the trees, this is really big. Yeah, it is. It's like 1,200 feet across. It's big. <laughs> Uh, although I would tell you some fish traps in British Columbia, similar to this in general form, are that big also. So I thought this was interesting and we should follow it up a bit. And at the time, I talked to Jeff Mogger, who was at the time uh, teaching anthropology and sociology up at Peninsula College. Jeff thought this was interesting. And then Jeff looked, because these DOE aerials are just consecutive images. And so he looked at the image right over here, the uh, 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 very next one. And so here's the two images kind of pasted together. Here's the arc that Nate Kearns first pointed out to me. And here's another possibly section of arc and there's another one there and it's harder to see, but there are multiple large arcs in the intertidal zone right here and again, this is a big area. This is like almost 1,200 feet. And this, these are big features. <laughs> um, OK, so we started looking for more information about them before we went in. And this is what they look like on Google Earth. And uh, you can see also in this image, the tide is higher. And a lot of them are actually in the water, or, you know, are not sticking out. You can see where rocks are actually visible above the things, but you can see that there's, and that's the first one that was pointed out by Nate Kearns. And then there's a bunch of these other things. Um, in fact, if you kind of want to squint, there's at least six arcs here. So, uh, you know, our first reaction, on my first reaction, and the first couple of people who went out there with me are archaeologists, and and our reaction is, is these things look like fish traps. They look like really big fish traps, but they look like fish traps. And uh, let me show you some pictures on the ground of what we're talking about, and just the area as well. So here we are out here, and oh, and let me also point out. For most of the next images that uh, we're gonna talk about, we're gonna focus on arc A, this one here. Uh, these things are a little bit more jumbled together and this one is a bit clearer and it's the first one we've noticed. So we've mostly looked at this one. Okay. So here we are out on the tide flat. This is on like a minus two foot tide and we're, not quite, in fact, if you can kind of see there's all through here, the distance, um, we're approaching arc A. So we're kind of in that other complex of less well defined ones. And I think you could see in this picture right here, um, it's a relatively steep shoreline. In fact, here are some pictures of the shoreline along this thing. It's a different day. <laughs> uh, but the shoreline, adjacent to these, and this is also kind of in the arc A area, but also in the others, is a steep eroding face. There's no low terrace along here anywhere where like a prehistoric settlement could be located. There's no flat surface, there's the beach. And this is a heavily eroded surface with lots of evidence of slide activity. And not only recent slide scars, trees coming down, but if you look at both of these pictures, uh, there's no older trees here, it's all young alder because this slope is, is clearly 
not very stable and it is moving down slope and bringing material to the beach every time it does that. Okay, here's a picture uh, with a couple of us. Uh, if you guys know other archeologists in the region, that's Bob Cockrell and that's Ross Smith. And we went out here and this is on this deep minus tide. And this is uh, early after the tide has really gotten into this quite low range. And you can see the water inside the impoundment is quite a bit higher than it is on this side. Uh, the, the wall, we'll call it, the wall right here, is actually pretty wide. It, it, it's almost 20 feet wide in places. Uh, but, it had, but you can see in this picture, there's really stacked up, piled up rock here. And in fact, as you walk, walk along the outside of it, uh, there's a stack pile of rock. There's the higher water in here. There's the lower water outside. The outer edge of this wall is very abrupt. The rocks are cobbled up and you can pretty much just draw a line right around the edges. There are more cobbles further out. Here's another picture of the same thing. It's a, it's a really impressively abrupt edge to this thing and pile rocks in it. And if you go, well, gee, there's some pretty large boulders there. There are some. Uh, it's mostly cobbles, but there are big boulders also. And it has this really sharp, abrupt edge. Okay, and this is what it looks like inside. And this is actually later in the tide uh, where most of the water is drained out of it now. You can see there still is some water in the, there. Um, we didn't spend a whole lot of time looking around in there. Uh, I could tell you there were some small fish sculping kind of things and stuff like that. I can't tell you there were a bunch of salmon in it or anything. Uh, that, but uh, most of the surface, but it does drain out pretty well. And the surface in here is a pretty compact clay substrate. It's not sand or gravel. It's a, it's a pretty dense, hard clay. You don't really have to worry about sinking in or anything like that there. Okay. Uh, the last time I was out there, I went out there with, with a number of geologists. And, geolo and, and to be honest with you, I'm not a geologist. I've taken geology classes. I spent a lot of time hanging out with geologists. I know some stuff about what they're how they operate and I respect geologists, but sometimes they feel like they live in a different world than I do. Um, in, in any event, they said, oh, these are from landslides. These are natural features. They were created by landslides. And they sent me some LIDAR maps, uh, similar to the ones that I, the one that I showed you for the kitchen dick feature to show me about the landslide, documented landslide activity in this area. And in this graphic, and you can see here, this is the A arc. They've drawn the boundaries on this one a little differently than I did off the, the Google Earth thing, but this is the other end of that same feature. So here's the, here's the two big arcs. And all of these little red things are slide scars. And so the place is riddled with slide activity, which the slides I show you uh, of the shoreline clearly indicate. And frankly, for those of you listening right now who have you know that there's a lot of very active slide issues around here. And as a matter of fact, uh, well, it's a little harder to see. Uh, this green line here, these are older slide scarps that are mostly bigger. There's another big one here. Uh, there's another one here. Uh, but these, uh, none of these slide scarps actually line up real well with these features, um, uh, which to me, they ought to, uh, if that's really what they are. And I would also tell you, um, not a geologist, but I'm a person who's walked marine shorelines a lot in Western Washington for more than 40 years. And I've seen a lot of slides and most slides don't have big arc features like that. So I think this LIDAR image certainly demonstrates there's been a lot of activity 
and a lot of material from slides have reached the beach all through this area. And frankly, this is a cutout of a much larger map. And this kind of structure margin is common from both directions, except for places where big stream mounts come out, like West Twin, which is just off the map here. So I find this particular evidence to be particularly convincing. And here's a LIDAR image of the AR, the one that I've shown you pictures of. And this LIDAR image, and clearly we can see the arc here. We can see what the larger boulders and more of the rubble here. And we can also see that there's an area kind of in the center of it, right along the shoreline, because this is the shoreline right here, where there's a bigger concentration of rubble and debris. And I can't say that I've ever done any modeling and slide dynamics, but I know a tiny bit about sediment transport. I did take one class on the subject many years ago. And my reaction when I look at this picture is that if we had a landslide that just occurred here and it produced a big pile of rubble where it hit the beach, because that's where it loses energy, because it's it's the great the slope is gone, it gains energy coming down the slope and then it loses energy. What I would expect to see is the largest, densest, heaviest stuff being close to the beach margin and then materials finding outward as the energy uh, dissipates from the slide hitting the flat. And so I would expect to see fines from there. And in fact, if we look at this image or when I look at it anyway, I see a zone right around in here where there's high density of rubble. And then I see a much broader zone around that extending out to this wall where there's really not much rubble at all. Uh, not hardly anything that really shows up in a LIDAR image. There's a bit more on this side, but, but this is relatively clean and open here. And then there's this wall. And I just have a lot of trouble visualizing how that could happen from a landslide alone. Um, and when I talk to uh, geologists about it, and you know, I ask where the slide scar is for it because I didn't see it on the other one, and they said, "Well, maybe the subsequent slides took it away." And that's an interesting idea, but it's not actually proof. So these are the lidar images and what the geologists have to say. And just a couple of other thoughts here. First off, I don't well, I don't have good imagery. Some additional relevant observations out about the place. We sure looked for a shellman deposit or any kind of evidence of occupation or pre-contact features at or close to these structures. And we don't see any. Now, it's a, it's a rapidly eroding and slide covered stuff. So maybe it used to be there, but there's no evidence of it now. Um, there's no ethnographic information that I'm aware of that describes settlements at or quite close to this location. Uh, there are reported settlements or seasonal camps at the mouth of uh, West Wind, which is about a mile and a half to the east, and at Dry Creek, which is almost two miles to the west. Uh, and those are not unreasonable distances for people to come out to use this thing if it's their fish trap. Uh, and there's no ethnographic accounts or reports of fish trap or any other acti economic activity at this location. And while there's not a giant amount of resources on that, there's more than a small amount of resources. Uh, uh, Waterman's uh, Puget Sound geography has a lot of details about the strait. And there's no comment about this place at all, which is kind of odd when you consider the amount of energy that must have been involved in constructing this thing to the extent that you think it was actually constructed. Okay, so what do we got here? We got some competing ideas about this. And, uh, you know, and honestly, there haven't been a whole lot of archeologists or a whole lot of geologists who've been out there, but I've been out there with groups of, south, of both. And so is this a natural feature? Is this a cultural feature? 
And I would say this, to me, this structure that we see out there is not typical of what we see in a landslide location onto the beach or in a tidal area in Western Washington. I'm hard pressed to think of other places in this area where you see similar things. And if anybody listening tonight thinks they knows of another place, I'd like to hear about it. I think we could also say that this structure might not actually be typical of other Northwest Coast fish traps, at least other ones I've seen that I think are fish traps, because it has, uh, the wall is really thick and there are large boulders in it, which we don't see in some of the others. And so to me, I'm kind of leaning to the possibility that maybe it's both, that we have a location here where landslides have brought rubble to the beach. And then after the rubble was on the beach surface, people reworked it while I was there. And I think particularly the LIDAR that I showed you of the arc, uh, the last one I showed you, is really consistent with that, that somebody's kind of recollected and moved and pushed that stuff up. And further, I would suggest that even if this is an entirely natural feature, it, it, it appears to function like a fish trap. And I think people in the area would notice that and would have used it. Okay, just a few other things. If it is cultural, whether they built it or they used it, it begs a few questions. And let me just run through those real quick and then uh, we'll, uh, we'll try to take any questions. Uh, and it's like, what is it? And I've told you all along here, I think it's some kind of a fish trap. Although there's another candidate, which I don't think is a good one, but it's worth noting. Uh, there are intertidal rock features that are being seen more and more on the Northwest coast that are called clam gardens. And here's a cross section and a clam garden is a place where a place where there's a rocky substrate Well, here they call it infill beach because this breaks up energy. Other people have described people take rocks out of the gravelly sandy substrate because they want to improve it as a habitat for clams and they build a retaining wall on the outside of it, which be, which allows the sediment and provide more depth and and it's a kind of aquaculture. Uh, and these things have been documented in multiple places and, and they absolutely exist. And in fact, here's a couple of pictures from British Columbia of clam gardens. Usually what you have is a rock wall on the outer side. This is the wall at this location. You can see there's a wall here too. And then sediment is filled in and it's a sand and gravel that's a good habitat for clams. This is really not what the West Twin features look like. And I've already told you the substrate in the middle is a hard, it's a clay hard substrate. It's not a good clam habitat. So I don't think it's a, it's a clam garden. Uh, and what else can we finally say? Well, if it's a cultural feature, then whose cultural feature is it? And like I say, these things are reported all over the coast, but in this case, I think we'd have to say that Sklalem people are the most likely candidates to have been associated with the structure um, when. Um, there's very little ability to date it at the moment other than this feature is associated with modern sea level. It, it, the sea level changes through it and that's why it functions as a trap. When uh, this feature, uh, we know that sea levels change a lot during the Holocene and modern sea levels are probably not more than three or 4,000 years old which is kind of an outer limit for how old this feature could have been. It could be quite old and, and have been maintained for some time. Although frankly, the absence of ethnographic information is, is kind of bothersome. And the why, if we say it's a fish trap, well, that's why. But the other question that I really have about it, although I can't tell you much, is if this is a cultural feature and even if it's just reworked landslide rubble. It's still an enormous investment of energy. And to me, there has to be some reason, if, that, if that's really what it is, as to why it is there where it is. I can't imagine people would have built it just because there was a good stockpile of rubble from a landslide that happens in lots of places. If this is really a, a culturally modified or built fish trap, then why did they build it here? And the only thing I can tell you about that 
is that I have talked to a few macaw fishermen who tell me that the silver, silver salmon come in close to the shore in the summertime. And as a matter of speculation, they suggest that that might be what it's targeted at, which uh, is maybe a good reason to go visit it in the late summer when silver is around and something I haven't done and see if there's any salmon caught in it. Anyway, that's uh, the range of what I wanted to present to you. Uh, like I say, you can go visit both of these things. I'm pretty confident that that the one on Kitchen Dick Road is the antenna site for the Voice of America curtain antenna. What specifically these piles of rocks are out at West Twin, I think remains an interesting enigma. Anyway, um, I'll stop there.